or whatever it is to, to ship something. Well, they had a deal with with Priority Mail then, which was called Railway Express, that said, we'll ship anything you want, any place in the U.S., for a flat fee as long as it can fit in a 5 by 5 foot box. And this fits in a 5 by 5 foot box because you take the individual sections of kite between the struts off, and every piece is 4 foot 11 inches. Curtis knew this. So that's how you shipped it. You charged people a nickel to have you assemble the airplane, and voila, you would have the airplane to fly. This is really one of the early versions of a Navy plane. If you look underneath the, underneath the center beam, there are little hooks. And those hooks were used to actually catch ropes on the first Navy plane. So this is the beginning of Top Gun, gang, believe it or not. I had the honor and privilege of flying this airplane once. We only hop it down the runway, but I took it to Australia. And I actually flew it around the field. And it was a joy. And it did everything the way it's supposed to. Very unconventional control system if you've never flown an airplane before. I'll show you what it is. Patrick's in there now. He's going to show you the rudder. Now, Glenn Curtis knew people coming out of the, uh, back in the day, they would actually fly these and it would steer it like a car because people were learning from automobiles back then. And then for pitch, there you go, four and a half for elevators in the front and the back. Your right foot is the accelerator. Now, if you're on a bike, Glenn Curtis was a motorcycle racer. What do you do when you turn the handlebars on a bike? What else do you do? You lean, correct. Can you see the in, in idea in this airplane? It kind of looks like a, a racing skiff. Very lightweight, but very strong, and less bracing wires in, in the fuselage because you just had a beautiful mahogany plywood. But again, back in those period of time, there was no standardization of controls like we have today. So how do you control the Hanrio? Well, Rene Hanrio and Eugene Ruchinet kind of came up with their own idea. So what happens with this airplane is, Rob's going to demonstrate, in your right hand, in your right hand, you've got your pitch. So your right hand goes forward aft, and that's your pitch. And then your rudder bar is on your feet, so you can control the rudder, left and right. Okay, now, your left hand operates a stick that goes side to side, and that operates wing warp, the Wright brothers patent back in the day. So how do you, you know, it's like rubbing your stomach and patting your head at the same time when you're flying the airplane and you, you control the speed, you would blip the engine. And the engine would, a good way to stop it is with that stick on the left side has a little blip button. Hear it? And you can, you're always good to be able to stop the motor. So that's how you control it and we're good to go. Let's get it down the field and give a flight in the hot real. See which way he throw elastic wing and they think it's better than actually having ailerons, so they may be trying that. But uh, single magneto, so there's nothing really to check other than turn around and go. Back in the day, it would have had a water-cooled engine. And this example is just an air-cooled engine that we have. We had a water-cooled engine in it for a while, but kind of gave, gave up the ghost on it. But we'll point it into the wind, and we'll get you a little hop, and we'll try to see if we can get it over the, try to get over this little ribbon here. But I want to take you back in the time, folks. All right? It's 1910. It was the year that the first Father's Day was celebrated. Penn Station came out, and maybe you were flying a hundred. And we're in the air, gang. <laughs> Start to blip the engine, control, you're ready to set. And like we say, not very high, not very far, not very fast, but just the same. That's how it's done. <laughs> Beautiful. Curtis Jenny. This has been flying here at Old Ryan Bet since the 60s. One of the significant ways that the Jenny was used, aside from a primary trainer in World War I for the U.S. After the war, they found a new engine that would have powered this Jenny after the war. It was designed by a former designer of the very famous Sopwood Airplane Company in the U.K. A chance meeting with Glenn Curtis at a newsstand in London with this designer, Curtis said, you ought to come work for me, because he wanted to build an airplane that would work for the armed forces of the U.S. in 1917, going into the war. So this young lad said, okay, he quit the top with company, and he decided what he'd do is set up a tent in his parents' backyard, that's how young he was, and he designed this airplane.
with paper, with pencil, engineering drawings, bike 20 miles round. Pretty remarkable stuff. Ken Cassins, warming it up right now, making sure that engine's in fine tip-top shape. Two magnetos, lots of power with it, with this hisso powered jetty. A lot of bracing on it, very popular for barnstormers, so they could have wing walker, walk, wing walkers on the wings. They have lots to grab onto. So Kenny's happy with the engine. We're happy to see it at the north end of the runway, and I'm happy to say, let's take off and turn back the hands of time. All of a sudden, gang, it's 1917. Not only watch, but listen. As you can and Wagaman's wing signaling that he's going to come in for a landing. But Ken restores this airplane. It's been a real workhorse there, but folks up here in the north, you might actually hear as Ken brings it in. We always talk about the wind in the wires. You might hear the sound of that racing through all those wires as he lines it up on the runway. And with a gentle sigh, 1917 Curtis Jenny returns to Rhinebeck, folks. Beautiful. That nice hisso just ticking over there. Overhead cams, automatic valve lubrication made it far more reliable than the old OX5s. Kenny giving you a wave. Dave King at the controls. One of the most feared fighters for a good period of time in World War I. And as he climbs out, an allied aircraft of the same period. Getting the warm up. Another copy machine, but quite accurately done. This is a SPAD 7. Take off that one. <laughs> Five. Saying you didn't get me this time. I just faked it on TV. Beautiful design, like a cigar almost. And it would have been a water-cooled engine back in the day. They had a radiator in it. And the radiator you could operate the shutters to if it was 27. And I'm guessing he's going to take off to the south. As you look at him taxi by, Ken built this whole airplane, took him about 6,000 man hours. And you'll notice the little window he's got to look out of. And that's it. That's all he's got. That's all Charles Lindbergh had. Everything else was fuel tank. See the little spinning device on the fuselage there? That's a very significant device for his navigation, the Earth Inductor Compass. And we went to Washington, the Air and Space Museum was so helpful in getting us to actually get this airplane to be copied. We were actually able to go up in the lift and actually take measurements. And I remember holding the stick of the airplane and thinking Charles Lindbergh used to sit in here for 33 and a plus hours. And that was kind of neat. But we took a lot of photos of the interior, and Ken, being the master craftsman that he is, was able to replicate this airplane piece by piece and manufactured everything, right down to welding the fuselage, 
We didn't put the actual long-range tanks to hold the 450 gallons of fuel, but the original was built in 60 days. This airplane was built with 6,000 man-hours over a number of years. And the Wright J-5 was really our big influence to, to again build this airplane, because that was the same 200 horsepower engine like Lindbergh had to fly across the Atlantic. So Kent's gonna run the engine up now, just to make sure everything is correct and good. We had a flight this morning, if you were here early or lucky enough to see it, signaling to the ground crew to go pull the chocks. Again, no brakes on this airplane. And we're going to roll it back about 94 years, gang. 1927, Holland Tunnel opened, and so did a route across the Atlantic, courtesy of Charles Augustus Lindbergh. Listen and watch. cooled engine you had water and hoses and a pump and a radiator and all the things that go along with that which add to weight this was a different animal it was called the wizard of aviation the gnome rotary engine the crankshaft is bolted to the firewall to the airframe and the cylinders rotate around the crankshaft you see those cylinders spinning around in there one of the most important things to have on the ground is that fire extinguisher a lot of raw fuel in there and they're prone to fire so Steve, I think, is going to give it the old Armstrong method when Brian is comfortable and a brief setting of the mixture. Castor oil used to lubricate because it wouldn't mix with the fuel. Let's fire it up and see how it goes. Engine didn't let lay out a warm warm up time at all. You just gotta get it and go. I think Brian's gonna go from the north, so he'll taxi by. You guys can get a good view of those fast moving spinning cylinders. Lightweight, self cooling, two of the important things for an engine like this. He's adjusting the selector switch. Going from quarter speed, eighth speed, half speed for a bit. That's how you, and you have a blip button on the top, you're always going to be able to stop the motor, as I said, with the Honrio. Doing S turns down the runway so we can see where he is going. Imagine 18, 19 year old kids flying these World War I in a squadron of these roaring gnome rotary engines. While he's taxiing down there, I got a word uh, from the state police. Somebody said there was an escaped convict. Uh, and if you have to keep your ticket with you, if you go over the Kingston Bridge, they'll let you go right through. They said something about that. No, no. Engines, 1,350 RPM is max. They have a very unique method of transporting the fuel into the cylinder. There are ports, transfer ports at the base of the cylinder. Now, you know, like when you open up a letter that's perforated, well, that's the same thing. So these cylinders can depart if you overspeed them, and that's a bad thing. Brian operating the selector switch. You'll hear it go eighth speed, quarter speed, half speed, and full speed. Doesn't fly very well on eighth speed, that's good for tactics. It's kind of interesting, Fokker designed this airplane and he started World War I with a monoplane and he ended World War I with a monoplane. This example of the 385 that were built, only a handful got to the front because of the fact that they were losing the war then and the materials weren't available. Look at the profile, the Flying Razor it was called. There's, there's quarter, eighth speed. Quarter speed, half speed, little blip, and then cub. Next to it, a 1929 Curtis Wright Jr. 
And then we're going to pull out the granddaddy of the J3 Cup, where it all began back in 1937. The E2 Taylor Cub, which I hope to do with mine soon. And skis. You could actually put skis and fly off the snow. Ton of fun to fly a J3 Cub. Nothing like it. But a design step, you'd see an airplane like the one you see right here first, which would be the Taylor Cub. C.G. Taylor and the Cub, and uh, Piper got together, forming their airplanes, eventually going off into their own ways. Taylor, of course, made the Taylor Craft, and Piper making the... You're going to take off your pants at the start of the gun. No, nope, yeah, come on, this is going to be fun. We're all grown-ups here. You're going to take off your pants... Yeah, and your boots, just your pants, and you're going to jump into your airplanes, and then the first person that lands and puts their pants back on and their boots wins the race, okay? I know you didn't sign a paper, but we'll do the paperwork afterwards. What do you think, guys? Should they do it? I mean, you want to talk about a photo op. Okay, we're going to do this on a count of five. Steve-O's got the starter pistol. Are you ready? Airplane's ready. Five, four, three, two, one, strip it! And boots are flying and pants are flying and whoa! Patriotic indeed from Ken Cassins. Doing the hound's tooth look is Mark Mondello and we're right out of the safari with Brian Coughlin. It's hard to fly these in stock in, without shoes on, I'll tell you that. Okay, ground crew at the ready, at their will, when they're ready and comfortable, we'll get these three airplanes started. See who can get in the air first. And the J3 Cub, getting going nicely. George Yance at the prop for the Taylor. 40 horsepower. It looks like the Cub is getting a good start here. Mark Mondello doesn't want to get his... Let's see if we can pick up the pants there so they don't get pulled into the propeller. Kenny wouldn't like to have those sliced up. All right, Curtis Wright Jr., good to go. Still humping on the A-40. Maybe it's that brick in the front seat that's causing the weight. Need to warm up a little bit. Doing S turns down the runway so we can see where he's going. These are all two place airplanes back in the day. But let's see what's going to happen here. I want to let that warm up just a little bit. Piper J3 Cub, circa 1941. Curtis Wright Jr. circa 1929, Mark Bandello in the Cub, Brian Coughlin getting some altitude little by little with that Curtis Wright Jr. Look at the forward visibility, wow. And last but not least, all the way down on the end, another 40 horsepower putt-putt we call them. Ken Cassins pouring on the coal of that 40 horsepower motor. Erica, nice. Really not climbing too well though, is he? What do you think, Steve? I don't know if he's climbing that well. I don't think he really got to work on that CG or something. Wait a minute. I think he should throw that brick out. Maybe that would help. There we go. Oh, now he's climbing. Oh my goodness. He threw out the brick and his underwear. Wow, talk about but lightweight. The problem with this particular airplane, they had an engine in it that was a three-cylinder radial, and the problem with those engines were they would, a cylinder a lot of times, would depart the engine. And the problem with that was it would depart and go right through the spar. That was a bad thing. So a more modern engine that Brian has on here, Continental 65 or an 85, it gives you a little more power, a little more reliability, a little more safety. Unfortunately, again, with a lot of these airplanes of that period, the depression really put a lot of the companies out of business. This was one of the ones that did. But 45 horsepower back in the day, big long wings, it was like a big powered glider, so it worked great. So let's get the, uh, let's get the fleet ready to go. 
And that Kinner engine just kind of chugging away. Before that wing! Yikes! Oh, here comes the responsible constables, folks. You guys, come on! They got the, they got the net. And this guy's hanging on for dear life on that airplane. Come on, you guys, get down there! Holy smokes! Yikes! Ladies and gentlemen, not part of the show. <laughs> that, I guess that convict's pretty scared hanging on there like that, and I would be too if we were hanging on the wing. Pedal to the metal here and see what is ha Wait a minute, folks. The convict is not off the airplane. I was wrong. He's on the airplane wing. Holy smoke. He's hanging on. Oh my goodness! Doing slow rolls over Rhinebeck. You guys, what are you doing out there? You're gonna get him. How are you gonna get him, officer? You got an idea. That's what I'm afraid of. What do you got? Your trusty single shot. What are you gonna do? You're gonna scare him a little bit. He says he's got one more shell. He's gonna scare him a little bit. Are you gonna scare the pilot or the convict? <laughs> oh, I see, you wanna... Ken is coming in, uh, maybe he's just gonna... Well, no, he's gonna, he's aiming. The wind is right. And, oh, and a dive into our village. Yikes. <laughs> All right, we're going to get these airplanes up into the sky to join that beautiful fleet. Taxing by for you, folks. Our 1929 New Standard D-25. Going to have a go at the balloon bursting here and back up in the air again. We're happy to see this year a beautiful Boeing Stearman Model 75 owned and flown by Rob Williams. Over 10,000 of these airplanes were built in the 30s and 40s. We're happy to have one flying here today. This would have been the U.S. answer to trainers in World War II. The aft, right after that, the British answer. The Tiger Moth you saw fly earlier. And another new addition to our fleet here, pardon the pun, a Fleet Model 1. Long line of rugged and reliable sport biplanes back in the day. This one in the markings of the Navy N2Y. Here we go, well done, nice shoot, Stevo. How about that, one shot Gatlin over there. You'll be back. <laughs> Keep him in the net, don't let him get away again. Good job, guys. That beautiful fleet in those mania bug bit hard with this airplane. Airplane made its home at the Naval Air Service at Memphis, Tennessee. Back in the day, many naval aviators learned to fly in this exact airplane you're going to see fly right now. Boeing Stearman Model 75. Good to see that back in the sky. Dave King, good to go again, flying that beautiful de Havilland Tiger Moth that his father, Bill, flew here for many years since about 1983. And last but not least, getting ready to go, pouring out of the coal of that Warner engine. Another beautiful fleet, this one, Model 1, circa 1930. Navy colors, Dr. David Trost at the wheel. Airplanes, beautiful sky. Kaylee O'Hagan, zip code is 07628. 
the rent the rides booth good because you got the first free ride after the show in that airplane landing right now Deerman in here you can take a look how big this airplane is you know for what it is 90 horsepower it was a great trainer very robust gear on it too for novice pilots rob williams putting into a good side slip getting it nicely slowed up that robust gear was great for folks who are learning how to fly it would soon be flying corsairs and hellcats in world war ii de havilland tiger moth the beautiful colors in the afternoon sun just kind of glow you can imagine the whole feel of those airplanes back in the day nice three-point landing wooden prop 130 horsepower before you got the spitfire you got one of those they said it's a just acquired this airplane we're happy to have it here at Old Rhinebeck. Side slipping in, that Hamilton standard prop just kind of glowing. Just plunking it in with those nice big balloon tires. Perfect landing. Dave Trost, Fleet 1, 1930. Who is our winner, Rebecca? Cole Palin's Fleet 16B. How many times has this landed here since about 1959? And there you go, ladies and gentlemen, all back on the grounds, safe and sound. And it's because of you coming through the gate, gang, that keep these airplanes in the... Thank you.